Well, I'm walking around outside wondering where are all the people, but look at you, you're here. It's fantastic. <laughs> Welcome to our panel. This is called Surviving China's Gaming Market. So show of hands, who's tried to survive China's gaming market? And um, you're still here raising your hand, so I guess that's a good sign, yeah? Although I'm not, I, I guess I want to get into details about if your companies are still surviving that market. And those who did not raise your hand, uh, who has considered whether or not China is the right market for their company? Okay, and who has said, China what? No, uh-uh, not going there. I like dumplings and that's about it. <laughs> Anybody? Nobody's gonna admit that one, but I know some of you are out there. Well, we are going to be here now to uh, hopefully take away some of the fear, introduce some more understanding, so that the rest of you can uh, appreciate the opportunity in China and go in warily so that you can understand what the regulations are, which are ever-changing, and you can understand um, some of the best practices and a few other, I guess, words of wisdom from my esteemed panelists. I uh, am the managing partner and founder of Nico Partners. This is our 17th year of conducting market research on the Chinese games market and other Asian markets as well. And in that time, we've watched the market go from $100 million in revenue a year to $31 billion in revenue a year. So just on revenue alone, it's, um, it's an impressive market to be part of, but it makes it, the Chinese government makes it a little bit tricky, and there are a lot of nuances there. And so today, with my panelists, uh, in the middle, we have Greg Pilarowski, who is the founder of Pilar Legal, a law firm that specializes in entertainment law, for the most part, between China and the West, and he can explain more about his company. We have Taewon Yoon, who's a general manager of global publishing at Super Evil Megacorp of Vainglory fame. And we have Andrew Tang, who's the chief business officer at GamePoc, which helps console companies right now uh, introduce and launch, uh, publish their game software in China, uh, most prominently for Sony and for other companies as well. So we have a few questions laid out for you, and I think we'll just kind of get to it. Uh, one of the barriers to China's market entry, to China market entry, is that a foreign company must partner with a domestic company to publish a game there. So, Greg, taking a look at uh, you as a regulatory professional, what is the importance of finding the right partner in China, and how can companies do that? You, you know that you're in trouble uh, when you're introducing a market and, and they've invited a lawyer to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are a number of barriers in China. Uh, the, the biggest one is what Lisa's already mentioned, and that is that uh, as foreign game companies, we can't self-operate or self-publish a, a game in China. That's something that's regulated by the whole framework that's designed to control the internet and the game industry comes in underneath that. Uh, as a result, no foreign participants are, are allowed. The other big regulatory burden is, is the game approvals, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but it means that if you're going into the China market, you, you know, with some narrow exceptions in the mobile space, if you self-publish on, on the Apple App Store, um, you have to work with a local partner. Uh, so step number one is going out and finding that partner. The, the helpful thing is, is that there's a lot of them, and that, um, that gives you a little bit more possibility with the biggest being Tencent and uh, NetEase number two. Mm, thank you. So, uh, Andrew, how can you find out if your Chinese partner is looking after your interests fully, and what can you do if they're not? Yep, so um, it depends on your strategy in China, right? So are you selling IP or are you just trying to sell a uh, final product? So for example, at GamePoc, we basically were a sub-publisher for leading publishers around the world, such as Take-Two, we're the official uh, sub-publisher for SNK and Take-Two, whereby uh, as a sub-publisher, we're basically an extension for the publisher within that particular territory. And just to what Greg just mentioned, um, is that you know, we handle all of the legal aspects. So in China, what you want to do is make sure that you find a partner that has the same vision as uh, your goals in China, 
and of course you have Tencent, you have NetEase for some of the bigger ones. Um, but keep in mind that in China you have mobile titles, you have PC titles, you also have console titles. So depending on your strategy and which type of platforms that you want, you, yet, that you're developing your games on, um, finding the right partner will definitely help you um, reduce some of your costs in terms of you know, making changes, necessary changes to adhere to the Chinese government regulatories. Um, but so basically it helps you uh, make sure that you, um, the titles are launched in a uh, simultaneous launch fashion around the world. And Taiwan, do you have anything to add to you know, the right, picking the right partner and any experience that you've had in your roles of, of what, what you can do if the right partner doesn't feel like they're looking after your interests? Well, um, I actually have some experience of like, getting burned uh, by the like, prominent partners in the, in the past, in my previous um, companies. Um, like, I think what I can say is that you do your homework really, really rigorously because um, it's the same everywhere, but especially in China, um, it is what it doesn't look like, right? So it's really hard to kind of like, uh, just looking at the um, articles like published in, in, in the West, um, and a lot of times it's like a little bit misleading. Um, and then the, um, like you, you have to take a look at the partner's reputation. You, you need to talk to them um, really deeply about like how they believe in what they do um, and so on, it, it requires a lot of due diligence. So I, when I deal with Chinese partners, I spent really a lot of time to do diligence on what they do, what they really do, um, and what they are saying and so on. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Mm. Uh, Greg, let's talk about this ever-changing regulatory landscape. I, I know my company has written way too much recently about the changing <coughs> regulations and every day there seems to be a new announcement from a new governing body and we had a very long gap of nine months where no games were approved whatsoever. So can you tell us what's happened in the past 12 months since maybe last April 1st and, uh, and, and kind of in a Cliff Notes version explain to the audience where we are now? Sure, probably the, the first point is you know what is a game approval? Um, in China because the Communist Party is running the show and they have censorship control over all forms of media, whether that's, that's news or, or movies or, uh, uh, or games. Before anything gets published, uh, including games, it needs to go through a censorship review to make sure that what's reflected in the games uh, doesn't conflict with uh, party ideology or, or other things that, um, that concern the government. So that's what we're talking about. Uh, these game approvals have been in place for a long time, but with the two meetings, every year there's two meetings from the National People Congress and the, um, uh, the CPPCC, the Chinese Political, People's Political Consultative Conference. It happens in Beijing every March. And with the last meetings in 2018, there was a government reshuffle. And so the two organizations that were the prime regulators of the game industry, uh, MOC and SAPRF, were reshuffled. And with that reshuffling, the game approvals shut down. Uh, and that shutdown lasted all the way until December, so a nine-month period. Uh, it attracted a lot of attention with Tencent's Q2 earnings call in August. Uh, because for the first time in 13 years, ten cents uh, net profits actually dropped, and it dropped by quite a bit, like over 20 points. So uh, it was a, a, a big issue, and and the folks pointed to the game approvals uh, being delayed as uh, one of the reasons. So the question was, when was it going to reopen? It did reopen in December. Since December, we've had about 1,000 domestic games approved. 30 foreign games approved. Uh, the next question is who's the regulator gonna be? Uh, and it looks like instead of having two regulators, we're probably only going to have one going forward. Uh, Gap, uh, they now report not to the state council, uh, but there's two parallel structures in, in China. One's the government, one's the party. They report up to the party, uh, to the propaganda department. So now uh, approving your games in China will be the uh, Communist Party Propaganda department. Mm -hmm. Good times, good times. So, 
uh, and we, at NICO, we call it SAP, State Administration of Press and Publications, there, and instead of GAP. I'm not correcting you, I'm just clarifying that if you were to read some of our stuff, we call it that because there had been a gap before, and now this seems to have a different kind of different affiliation with the state government. And the, uh, but either way, it seems to be one body. And keep in mind that there have been this isn't the first time that everything has changed hands. Quite often in the past, there's been a regulatory helmsman change, and uh, and it kind of lines up with when the state council has said. Are the people we appointed to do this job doing their job well, or, or are they not doing their job so well? And they've recently decided that the, it needed a refresh, and here we are with a new body, which seems to be fully staffed at this point, and new rules are being published every day, it seems. Can I yes. jump in on this? Yes, please. Um, so wh one thing I'd like to point out, like without all these um, techni technical technicalities, um, is, is that the um, this is not the first time like similar stuff happens. Like exactly 10 years, actually 12 years ago, um, similar stuff happened. There was a um, like reshuffling of the um, um, who is gonna govern the censorship uh, over PC games in 2007, eight mm -hmm. um, around that time. And then like similar thing happened as well. Like kind of like they kind of stopped like uh, giving out the um, um, <coughs> censor number. At the time, it happened only to the um, um, like foreign games. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that it happened like to mobile, which was not in the past, uh, was regulated by the governing body. Um, so I, I think that that made, you know, one of the reasons why it, it made a lot of the fuss. But the, um, if you've been like in China, dealing with Chinese issues for a long time, like to me it was like, yeah, it's a part of life. Yeah, it's right? a part of life. <laughs> So the, if you deal with China, you gotta expect this sort of stuff happens. It doesn't mean that it, it's not the end of the world. It never is, because the Chinese government, like even though they are communist, communist uh, like government, uh, they are pro business, right? So they, I don't think they will be um, like ever shut down completely. Um, but the, uh, they will try to make your life a little bit um, like fun. Mm. Um, that's all. Like they're in game game business, like right. You have, you have to have some game fun itself. playing with yeah you know, Chinese government. The game yes. itself. There you go. Um, it's yeah, called, I mean, it's called the mind sleeper. There, <laughs> there are there are rules now, aren't there, Greg? That when we can say recently, they said there'll be no pool you, in your game content. You can't have any pooling of blood, and it can't change from red to green, and all these other. But historically, blood has already been banned in game content, hasn't it, Greg? And and we can see things, examples from the past where this shouldn't look like some new crazy regulation. That's, that's right. So there um, have been some media leaks uh, just in this last week about who the new regulators are and what some of the tweaks in the rules will be. Um, it, it's almost as if uh, the folks at, at VentureBeat have uh, incredible influence over in Beijing because the news came out just before our panel today. <laughs> um, but. The, a lot of the rules are restatements of, of prior uh, rules. There'll be um, the same type of anti-fatigue things. There's some tweaks to the treasure box rules. Uh, there's a few content things that are mentioned. The WeChat mini games now will require approvals before they didn't. Um, and there's also going to be an adoption of self-censorship. So in the past, the Ministry of Culture had uh, a very uh, efficient system for self-censors where they trained game censors inside all of the game companies. And then the game companies would have to do their own self-censorship review and submit a report when they're uh, applying for the game approval. Uh, GAP has decided, or, or SAP has decided, um, great idea, let's outsource the, the, the censorship to the game companies themselves, or at least the level one review. And that's gonna be happening now under the new regime as, as well. Okay. And Andrew, your, your expertise is more in the console space. <coughs> And consoles were banned in China for 14 years, but they are no longer banned, and yet uh, they're not super popular there. The Chinese gamer is more accustomed to, and perhaps more suited toward playing on PC or mobile devices. Uh, but lately there's been um, more traction with PS4, and there's been some news that Tencent will distribute um, Nintendo Switch. And so what are the opportunities for console games and hardware 
in China. And how about on any other kind of TV-based gaming? Yeah, this is the reason why we actually started GamePunk. <laughs> was back in 2015 when uh, after the 14-year uh, ban, uh, Sony started selling their console in March of 2015, and then we started the company in August of 2015, specifically to focus on uh, publishing on that particular platform. Um, as Lisa mentioned, it is, you know, it's, it's tough business right now for both console business because keep in mind that as the rest of the world, you know, you're talking about, say, Sony specifically, you're talking about around 90, 91 million install base, where in China you have a very small fraction of it. It's because, keep in mind, China, the, the gaming business actually grew um, from playing mobile titles. But now, what we're seeing is that, you know, there are provincial uh, different provinces within China that are looking under the big screen as sort of the next phase of entertainment. So we're partnering very closely with Sony, what we want to do is to continue to bring AAA titles that run on the, you know, for, for China, keep, also keep in mind that it's first generation for them. For us, we're about to move into the next generation of, of console product. But in China, um, you know, PS4, a lot of people never even heard of, especially in, you know, the lower tier cities, second, third, fourth uh, t tier cities. However, um, th I think there are some research paper that came out of Nico Partners that demonstrated the, the amount of time that people would like to spend on the big screen um, shows that there's tremendous, tremendous growth potential for the console business. Okay. Well, in the past 12 months, uh, we have seen like zero foreign AAA titles get approved. And now as of uh, hopefully this month, we're gonna see a restart of of submissions for big games and the backlog of game approvals that's, that was built up for the nine months that game approvals were, was halt, were halted, um, we will start to see, there were 30, as Greg said, 30 foreign games published, but not all of them were big games. So why should this audience here still care about China? What makes it so enticing? And is it the most important market in the world? And, and uh, what's the future potential there? Taiwan? Well, um, like, let me put it this way. The, um, if you look at the uh, PC, mobile, and console market of the world, um, like now mobile gaming market is around 50% of the entire market. 50% um, of that is taken by China. Uh, similar thing about uh, PC as well. So console has been predominantly in, in the Western market, but if you are on PC or on mobile, being in China and then the being successful in China is um, like really the way to like go for your growth of, uh, as a game game developer. Um, and then the um, um, like there are a lot of like uh, China has always been like felt like a um, is gold mine um, layered with mines. Right, so you have to navigate like really carefully, but if you do your job correctly, like it can, um, like it give you uh, a lot of like uh, reward. Um, so in, in the past, you know, I uh, I dealt uh, China like as a part of the um, Blizzard uh, World of Warcraft team, um, and then there was a lot of fun time dealing with the um, um, censorship in China. <laughs> uh, Relaxing. That was a, like a holiday for you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was. Um, yeah, really good vacation of the last 17 years. Like uh, Lisa and I sort of started this around the same time in, in China, but not, not in the same company, but I started to look at the um, China like 17 years ago as well. Um, and anyways, um, like I, I do think that you can do it, but again, without like hard work, actually a, a lot of vacation, um, without like really studying uh, what you need to do. Also, uh, a lot of mistake, uh, like Western de developers and publishers make is that you, you cannot just bring your game into China and like expect you, you're gonna be successful. Uh, first of all, censorship is not gonna uh, allow you. Um, like as an example, the Fortnite um, and uh, PUBG are two <coughs> titles that are still pending on getting approval. Uh, people are just like, a, a lot of like uh, Western journalists like looking like purely at the, uh, yeah, like approval uh, started to resume. Um, when Fortnite and PUBG will be published. Um, 
not knowing exactly what's going on with um, Epic or uh, PUBG, uh, my guess is that you know, they should have been asked to modify a lot, like this blood issues and everything. And then if you're not accustomed to it, or if you don't know what they're really, what, why and what they're asking, um, it takes a long time for you to um, like, like fix your, not fix, like modify your stuff for, for China market. And then that's why I kind of don't expect the Fortnite or PUBG to come out this year at all, because like I, I'm sure that they'll be going through that process of um, modifying things over and over again. Well, you brought up PUBG, and uh, there's PUBG Mobile by Tencent, but PUBG for PC is wildly popular in China without being allowed there. So what's with Steam? They're just, the government just doesn't care? It, like Steam is not approved, <coughs> and yet Steam games are super popular and generate a lot of money. Uh, and PUBG just announced, well, we did some calculations, and it looks like a lot of revenue on PUBG comes from Asia. So what, what's happening there, Greg? <laughs> <coughs> That's a great question. Um, so Steam is, uh, to put it politely, op operating illegally uh, in China. They don't have any of the licenses that, they <coughs> that they're required to have to be able to publish games there or distribute games there. Uh, and then the games are not getting the game approvals as well. So it's a, it's a non-compliant platform. Now, it has been publicly announced that Valve is cooperating with Perfect World to launch um, a Steam China version that, that is compliant with the rules. Uh, and so we'll see how that, um, that strategy plays out. Uh, Epic, obviously, have, have also launched their platform recently. Um, we'll see where that goes. Tencent owes 40% of them. So perhaps they'll make some forays into the market as well. Uh, but at the same point in time, Tencent seems to be uh, somewhat disenchanted, as I can understand, with their own domestic market, given the regulatory hoops that, that they need to jump through. And so they've recently uh, launched an international version uh, of their own store, uh, we, we Game X, um, perhaps hoping that uh, the external environment will be politically a little bit more, more stable than their, their internal environment. OK. But doesn't iOS have the same problem? iOS. iOS. Well, you're right. I, Apple is also operating illegally in China. Um, and you know, we've had conversations with the regulators about that in the past. And um, their responses were really interesting. Uh, there were two points. One was, uh, this is above my pay grade, uh, the, the Chinese version of that, um, which essentially they, they meant that there was multiple considerations. Um, I think with the iPhone being popular at that time, its, you know, its market share has gone down since then. Uh, but there were tie-ins that Apple had with China Mobile and China Unicom. Uh, and Apple also has its own version of, of lobbying happening in, in Beijing. Uh, the second comment that they said is that Apple's doing a good job. Uh, but what that means, Apple's doing a good job when it's coming from the guys who censor stuff, means that Apple is doing a good job of self-censoring their platform. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're not fully compliant with the game approvals, but uh, you know, you're not going to see Dalai Lama wins Hollywood type game going into China on, on the Apple platform. I guess you can put it in a way that the, um, like they are not on the radar yet. Um, like more like you know they are on the radar, but you know, like uh, like they are turning their eyes to the other way. Um, if let's say um, some social stuff happens around that, like the next day they will get shut down. App Maybe. Apple's not on the radar. No, I mean I mean the like the fact that the um, um, like non-compliant games are on iOS App Store and then Steam, they are essentially a censorship like government uh, body is looking the other way uh, because there hasn't been like real issues, but once it got, let's say, reported on the newspaper in China or not, then they will stop it. I, I think it's one, one scandal away. Yep. And so, uh, you know, if you have a situation where there's a game that's, that's published um, on Steam or on Apple that has an Easter egg about free Taiwan, not that this actually happened, <laughs> um, that that could, in fact, uh, capture some attention and could lead to political troubles um, for them. And Andrew, you, you, know, you no, Well, actually, one of the things I wanted to add yeah. was that um, you know, the reason why you want to find a local partner that works with you also is you know, get the 
approvals properly is going to help you set up you know, the servers, assuming you're running an online game or whatever, set up the proper infrastructure for good user experience. You know, we can talk about Steam all day long, we can talk about all these other gray area type platforms, but from a user perspective, a Chinese player, you know, they're not gonna go through you know, setting up VPNs and doing all sorts of things and paying it with an American credit card, which most of them don't have. Um, you know, you, you wanna bring, you wanna localize your payment, you wanna set up the proper infrastructure, you need, and before you do all of that, you need to get the approvals, right? Once you get approvals, then you can set up the infrastructure, the, the, the payment framework, and all that is to help, you know, sort of the local players feel like the title is made for them within China. Yeah, I'd say that's really important. Having the, you know, the majority of the Chinese gamers feel like their game, the game you want them to play is made there and they can right. relate to it and they recognize things in it and it's culturalized and localized at the same time and also has gameplay elements. I mean, we've done some very big studies on the motivations of Chinese gamers and including uh, that, that the, da the data in those studies supports why esports is so huge in Asia because these gamers are motivated by competition and completion and challenge and community. And, uh, and so if you recognize that games with those components might be accepted more widely and you localize and culturalize your game there um, and it doesn't have any pools of green blood <laughs> and you're not waving a Tibet flag, you might get your game approved and then be wildly popular. Uh, and so esports is one area that's kind of booming and I think is a main driver, but there are also some other technology areas, you know, like a, a part and parcel with esports. We have streaming video, which is, you know, even this week, another streaming video company had its IPO in the US. And, uh, and then we have cloud gaming coming and mm -hmm. In the infrastructure and the ancillary related uh, industries, I think, in China are, are there to stay to support these hundreds and hundreds of millions of avid gamers in China. Um, and so I think that there is still a lot of great potential, and despite the regulations which have a heavy fist. Um, and it, does anybody have any final things to say about why we shouldn't just give up on this huge market? Um, I, I go first. Um, so um, I, I do think that the uh, right now is a really interesting time um, as a game developer, like for everywhere. Um, in in case of China, like with uh, cloud gaming and whatnot, because the, their ecosystem is I isolated from outside of the world, I do expect that the um, like what's happening here, like for the next like two three years or five years. Um, we'll probably um, like started to uh, like trickle through China a little bit later, uh, but once they started to do something, then the adoption is really fast, and then the like end resulting market will also be really great. I'm, I'm specifically I'm like really interested in how uh, cloud gaming will perform in China. Um, for example, like there's no way for um, Google to be able to um, have Stadia in, in China. And then who's gonna who's gonna do the drop of Google in, in China? Is it gonna be Tencent or like some other technology, or will Google do the um, JV with someone in, in China to do that stuff like that? Um, the reason why I'm I think that cloud gaming is especially uh, like interesting thing because it's because it is actually the um, essentially putting your consoles on um, on, the, on the cloud. As uh, Andrew said, um, it's not that uh, Chinese players don't like console at all. Um, first of all, it was not available to them for a long time. Now uh, it is available, but a lot of people think that it's too expensive. And then there are also uh, a lot of piracy going on. Um, that's how PC and mobile gaming has become the majority of the gaming market in, in China because you cannot pirate it. Hmm. Um, so I think the same thing is gonna happen to cloud gaming as well. Okay. That's why I'm like, really excited about that. Excellent. All right, well, I'm going to give uh, Greg 15 seconds and Andrew 15 seconds. So um, a, have at it. A parting commercial. Um, if you're interested in the regulatory framework, we'll be releasing a China regulation watch next week that gives a thorough update on all the game approval, uh, new rules, and then this summer working 
with Lisa at Nico Partners, we'll do the fifth edition of a hundred plus page memo on uh, the, the game regulatory landscape and chart in China. If you go to our website, you can sign up and, and those come to you um, for free. If you have a hard time sleeping at night, I recommend it. All right. Uh, you, ha you have to read it though. You have to read it. And Andrew, you got... Um, one second. You one second. <laughs> you have negative seven. Let's go. All right. So basically, you know, I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, we just went through this freeze, but you really got to think about, you know, coming out of this past, what, nine, ten months, right? What, what China has really done is to, this, this whole reformation basically reset, you know, sort of like the requirements for foreign titles coming to China. China is 34 billion today, and it's estimated to grow to 42 billion within the next three years. So, you know, if you have titles, China is definitely, you know, should be on your radar. And just go through the proper channels. There, you, you know, you'll be able to find a potential market for your products. All right, that's it. I guess we, we have no time for questions, but if you want to find us, we will be wherever we are told to go to answer your questions. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you.